Hi, this is Pod Save the UK. I'm Nish Kumar. And I'm Coco Khan. Welcome to part two of our festive special, looking ahead to 2024. And if this year is anything like last year, that is going to be horrifying. <laughs> We're joined by comedians Catherine Bohart and Andy Zaltzman, who will be looking ahead to the big moments of the next 12 months. We'll be trying to make some predictions and we will be holding them to it. Because you can't just make an inaccurate prediction and get away with it, unless, of course... You're a British newspaper columnist, in which case, say anything you like, you get paid for life. Happy New Year and welcome to the first show of 2024, which confusingly we're recording in 2023 because we are going to get our money's worth out of our special guests, Andy Zaltzman and Catherine Bohart. If you haven't heard them help us make sense of the binfire that was British politics in 2023, please do give our last episode a listen. We had a lot of fun making it. So let's reintroduce our fabulous panel properly. Catherine Bohart is an actor, writer and comedian who you'll probably recognise from her appearances on shows like Mock the Week and Live at the Apollo. She also co-presents the podcast Trusty Hogs, and she'll be touring her stand-up show again with feelings from March next year. Andrew Andy Zaltzman is a comedian <laughs> and uber cricket nerd. He's the chair of Radio 4's The News Quiz and also hosts the satirical podcast The Bugle, which frequently features me. And he will also be out on the road from March next year with his Bugle live shows. Um, nice to see you both. Thank you for continuing to be with us here. Oh, thanks. Oh, it's been great. We've been hanging out for the last, what, five, six days since we were <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, Also, I haven't moved, so yeah. things are really starting to smell <laughs> down there. Oh, God. <laughs> Why do I even deserve this, I <laughs> oh, no. um, I don't like being is... described as an Uber cricket fan, by the way, Nish. That does make it sound like you can just you book me through an app. <laughs> On demand cricket. cricket. Yeah, I know, but that is sort of how I treat you, Andy. When the cricket's on, I do text to you quite a lot Andy, to ask for the statistical backgrounds to various various players' careers. And may I refer to you, you to the episode we just made where you talk about cricket an inordinate amount oh, yeah. for a political <laughs> podcast. Very cool. Very cool. He only speaks in, what is it, referee, commentator? Go on. <laughs> Uh, for uh, listeners from outside the UK, if I may quote from my own stand-up material, cricket is the result of baseball having unprotected sex with a library. Um, <laughs> it so is. God, it's boring. Catherine, what is the one thing oh, you would love oh, to happen dear. to you in 2024? <laughs> I've just moved in with my girlfriend and her par- and her, her friends. Are my, our friends. Yeah. Oh, why am I blaming her? It would be rude to say to move out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I keep calling my car my panic room and she's like, don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, gosh, what would I, 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 boring, I would love to see this government gone, sorry, but, that, but it does That'll feel like they're awesome. happening to me, that's why it's in my, my brain, it's like, <laughs> oh my god, how is this still, also, I would love to think that there are, there are probably people who've been voting, their entire voting life has been losing. Yeah. Mm. Has it been going, oh, That's whoa. me. That's yeah. me. Really? Oh, yeah, gosh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The only one, I've, uh, only one I've won, personally me, was uh, Sadiq Khan's mayoral election. Good lord! I was hungover just... for like four days after that. Yeah, I just want the kids to have a good time. I I, I voted in uh, two thousand and five, so I did uh, vote for the winning side uh, in nice. my first election. But since then, it has been, been downhill, a, baby. A yeah. slow descent, Bar Sadiq. <laughs> I got here in twenty twelve, and it's been whew, nice, <laughs> rough. Do you remember winning, Andy? Winning? Um, well, not not in not in, in anything that I've achieved myself. <laughs> not. Um, but at least you, I, I, I you backed the right horse a couple of times. Yeah, I, I came second in the silver medal winning championships at my local <laughs> um, <laughs> club. That was, I don't know if that counts as a win or not. Um, what would you love to happen to you in 2024? To me so? personally? Yeah. Um, well, I'm going to turn 50 in 2024. and I'd It's next year the big 5-0. It is, yeah. Um, I'd quite like that not to happen. <laughs> um, not, not in terms of me dying before. I just think... I, I think I should be given another year in my 40s, I think. Um, I'd like to win Wimbledon, but I mean, <laughs> it's good to set the bar. bar. Those, two, those two things sell them to inside. Yeah. Yeah. Do they have an over 50s amateur competition? Not, not, in, not as part not of the yet, main... Not yet, not yet. No, not yet. So, um, yeah, but I'd just... I'd, I'd like to learn to levitate. Um <laughs> And just like float around. I think that would be like a fun way to get through the year. Okay. So next time we see you, you'll be David Blaine? No, I'm not saying I'll achieve it. I'm just saying it would be quite nice to be able to do it. Exactly. I'm not predicting that's going to happen, Coco. I have just remembered one thing I'd actually quite like what? to happen to me. I would quite like to be the first lesbian couple to have an accidental baby. 
I mean, I would just love if we what, just, you mean just like some just accidental from trying. sperm just floating <laughs> no, I don't around mean, like, in the slipping ether. Slipping on a turkey baster. I just mean like <laughs> I'd like all the trying to work, and it's not because I don't really know how like, how we're supposed to do it. Otherwise, theft. I assume. Oh, what you mean, just um, like, and everyone's like, how did that happen? Yeah, and it's like we just really committed to it. <laughs> we we, 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 we managed. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We put it on our vision board. <laughs> We may have some of our wishes come true because under British law, if an election hasn't been called by the fifth anniversary of the last one, Parliament is automatically dissolved and an election is held 25 working days later. The fifth anniversary of our last election is the 17th of December 2024, meaning the latest possible election date is the 28th of January 2025. Can you hang on that? Are you going to be able to survive? for this next so maybe 13 is, is months. Is the country going to be able to survive oh, yeah. for that long? Yeah. Did, would, so did basically, technically, if they do delay until January, I think 2024 would just be extended a month. <laughs> <laughs> um, they'll go to the Supreme Court yeah. and they'll get some ruling about what a year is. <laughs> or that 2025 is unsafe, actually. Yeah. Yeah, and we yeah. won't be moving into it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, I'm genuinely going to open a sweepstake on this and I'm, uh, we'll put a tenner in and the closest gets the pot I, I personally I'm going to go for uh, October the 17th uh, because that's just before it starts to get really dark and cold so when he loses Sunak can jet off to California and spend Christmas in the Santa Monica penthouse that he owns well, uh, anybody else got any specific date suggestions? I'm wondering when Silicon Valley companies do their most hiring I'm not entirely sure. Listen, I'm going to go December 16th. I think we are assuming, like a rational person would call it before then. I think we're assuming he's a rational person. A rational person would never have left California and dinner parties with people who are richer than God to run <laughs> to run a cabinet of fuckwits who could only agree on like one, a, a party that agreed on one thing in the last however many years and it was that they prefer Liz Trust to you. Yeah. Like that is not a reasonable man. So the latest possible date is where I'm putting my money. Thoughts? A Cabinet of Fuckwits is my favourite Tom Wolfe novel. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've got a few dates that I think are quite likely 25th of December. Um, yeah. I Wait, think, do you mean the election will be on? Yeah, on the 25th of December. I think they are going to just... The only the only way that they, they think they can win is to ruin Christmas. No, but on a serious note, that yeah. was being touted, not the 25th of December. It's going to be the 25th, Coach. But, but, but a December election, knowing full well that people will be disengaged, I mean, that has been yep. sp speculated in the press, yeah. And uh, also that presumably older Tories don't have families who want to come around, so <laughs> they can go to the, po the, 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 the yep. polling booth. Um, also, you know, the economy will get boosted in the previous, like, 10 days. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> that might work. Um, Chilling. The uh, alternative Very. 14th of February, which is a Wednesday, but, you know... <laughs> To, to try to get people to vote, to feel the love yeah, for yeah. democracy. <laughs> I'm not sure we've ever had a Valentine's Day election. Um, I don't know. I'm not a rocket scientist. Um, 1st of August, because it's during the Olympics, and that that's... And, and in fact, I think a Snap Olympic, I've called it... I've suggested this many times over the years. A Snap Olympics is what this country is. <laughs> a snap election. Um, uh, 31st of October, Halloween just seems appropriate. Or <laughs> Just for the bands. Tuesday, Tuesday the 5th of November, which is the day of the US presidential election. <gasps> I think we should double up. Also bonfire night, on. right? Yeah. Isn't that... Yeah, yeah. Didn't the guy destroy Parliament then? Well, well he, no, tried. He, he tried. He tried. Yeah. He quite famously did. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, I remember him. guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 technically, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you, you're so close. Just <laughs> keep going. <laughs> you skirted around the details. A man called Guy <laughs> tried to fail to destroy Parliament. You've transmogrified that into a guy blew up Parliament. <laughs> yeah. That's sorry. the way media works, isn't That's it? That's the whole vendetta. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Let's talk about a man likely to be Prime Minister within the next 12 months, excluding some sort of weird disaster or act of God. It's Sir Keir Starmer. Or, or assuming that the British electorate doesn't do what seems to come naturally to it and just vote for the Conservatives. Yeah, yeah that is the default, isn't it? Um, so what are our expectations from him? He's obviously trying to keep a low profile. He just wants the Tories to implode. Fair play. That is working. They are doing that. But as the polls traditionally tighten, Labour will need a 12% swing to win a majority. So if their 20-point lead narrows to 15 as we approach the election, he's going to need to do more to inspire the voters. What would that look like for you guys? I just really hope one of his New Year's resolutions is like gain weight but in his personality. But I feel <laughs> like he won't. I think the tricky thing about Starmer finally being, and I keep forgetting that is what comes next probably, yeah. with him actually being PM, is that he'll go to stuff like NATO summits and we'll have to be like, yep, that's the guy who I chose. Because I'm so used to now being like, oh, well, he's the one everybody else wanted and at least he's not that other guy. But having to be like, 
Yep, that's my there guy. There's our guy. It's just like it's like I don't know if anybody else had like a very un, like non competitive dad at sports day, but my dad was like a runner, but he couldn't be fucked to try at sports day. You know, like when the dads have to race. So you just have to be like, yeah, that's my dad. Yeah, I don't. Know. And it's just so frustrating. I think it'll be that. Um, very specific answer to your question. <laughs> I mean, since we've said the last couple of people that we've said, which is sort of pork market Sally and the Microsoft paperclip in human form, <laughs> it, it feels like anything would sort of be an upgrade. Um, Andy, what do you think Starmer's got to do to capture the imagination of the British public? Well, I think he'll probably remain cautious. Um, I, I don't think people will particularly warm to him, which in some ways it might be a good a good thing for... <laughs> For politics, I would hope as we get close to election, we'll see, yeah, a bit more political ambition and um, precision in a sort of vision of what he hopes his government will be able to achieve within the constraints that they will they will inherit. So I don't think it's going to be spectacular. It probably doesn't need to be spectacular as he you know just stands there and say, "Look at these guys." That should be enough. You know, I think if he just does the job he's supposed to do, we might rally around him. Have you ever seen um, a friend who used to have a terrible boyfriend get a, like, completely bland new one? Yes. You were like, Dave's the freaking best. This guy's amazing. (laughs) Like, it takes, like, 12 years before you're like, so like, does Dave have any interests or who cares he's matter. not the guy before it so doesn't I, matter yeah. he didn't start a kitchen fire at the last you know house fire I mean? like, there's, there's a lot to be we well, might really rally <laughs> I'm hoping for some like Scooby Doo takes his mask off it's Clement Attlee surprise oh, well, that would I mean, be that, amazing but I think with AI and with the power of the occult <laughs> We can basically we can basically achieve that. I mean, because I don't know who they've been consulting in recent years, but I think the Rwanda policy was essentially a seance involving, um, I don't know, Beelzebub himself and Enoch Powell, you know, possibly Enoch Powell and um, yeah, Salvador Dali. Essentially, that's you know, so why not? So we also know there's going to be an election in America. Um, they will vote for their next president on November the 5th. I guess the two questions are, can anyone stop Trump from winning the nomination? And <laughs> I mean, that's the only question, please. Number two, please, can someone stop Trump from winning the presidency? He's facing so many different court cases. There's electoral interference in Georgia. There's civil fraud in New York and the classified documents case in Florida. But also... There's the hush money case in New York and there's the whole federal case about the, you know, the time on uh, January the 6th when uh, him and a bunch of Nazis tried to steal the whole government. It, 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 it's absolutely astonishing. He, he's currently polling, I would say, alarmingly high. I, is there anything that can stop him? Well, I think there possibly is. And if you think back to the previous two elections that he ran in, he lost the popular vote and by yeah. quite a massive margin last time. So, I mean, he inspired the biggest ever vote against a sitting president. Yeah. So you would, he's not done anything to win new supporters. Yeah. I think that's fair to say. I mean, it, if he does win, it would basically look like the end of civilization. I think it might actually be a zombie apocalypse as previous generations rise from their graves <laughs> and say, America, you have let yourselves down very badly. <laughs> it's hard to envisage a world in which him winning again is possible, but it does seem to be harrowingly possible. And it, it I mean, it, it is astonishing what America is doing to itself. Yeah. Are you it, worried, Catherine? Yeah, I mean, I'm worried. I think it's more likely a case that he will, it will be Joe Biden who loses it for himself. But I also do think we're in a situation where the only thing that could really stop either of them um, is it's weird that the American politicians are so old that it feels yeah. like maybe death is the answer for either to end their campaign. But it's weird to be in a situation where you could wake up and hear the news that both presidential candidates have died and be like, natural causes? Question mark, <laughs> I guess. Well, they just started doing duels again. Like yeah. in the glory <laughs> they both got what they wanted. That's right, get a good decent musical out of it. <laughs> <laughs> They're both like, nostalgia for our youth, let's duel it out. Oh, yeah, God. wild. The only thing that could make this worse is a rapping Donald Trump. <laughs> Andy and Catherine are kindly sticking around for a few more minutes to help Nish and I go through the contents of the PSUK mailbag. Don't worry, guys. Yes, there could be complex questions about our political system, but there are also messages like this one. Hey, gang. Um, It's Matt Leshnevsky. 
I really like the show and I had a question. Um, and there's been a bit of a trend in the past few years with famous people fighting each other in boxing matches. <laughs> I think it started with some YouTube celebrities, um, but now there's been chat about a Zuckerberg versus Musk yeah. fight. Um, and we've also seen politicians going on reality TV shows with Matt Hancock and now Nigel Farage. So I think it's only a matter of time before our politics involve punching the shit out of each other <laughs> live on TV. So my question is, which two politicians would you like to see fight? Uh, I really appreciate your expertise on this. <laughs> uh, yeah, thanks. Um, well, That's guess so first, funny. Catherine, which two politicians would you like to see? For, I also really love the use of the phrase, I, I really appreciate your expertise, expertise on this. Yeah, this yeah. is literally the only <laughs> political conversation we are, are qualified with any expertise. I would say that every Tory combo I can think of would be like that fight scene from Bridget Jones. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> that said, I would probably cast um, Jacob Rees-Mogg and maybe Steve Baker. Yeah. Well, okay. I think that's a that's a that's a fight I'd watch. Yeah, that's that that's a fight for or the sort soul of, chase of the heart. Chase around right. the ring. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, who would you like to see fight? That's um. So on what kind of fight are we talking? Are we just talking like... I, I think you can set the parameters. I right. mean, it, 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 the, the reference here is to the Musk Zuckerberg that I think would probably be like a sort of MMA right, UFC okay. type So thing. we're not talking like... Cockfight. Like, well, not, <laughs> we not, 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 not talking you know, Maximus Decimus Meridius against the <laughs> Commodus in front of a Bain Coliseum. I think that would be... I, could, I mean, like that, that could work. Trump Biden wrestle could be. I mean, it would be more civilized than any debate that they would, <laughs> that they would, could just be hacking at each other with swords, and it would be more edifying for for America. So I would quite like to see that because I think that would be a massive improvement on what we're actually actually going to see from a British politics point of view. I think it's time that uh, King Charles started using his hardware. Um, we saw him. <laughs> You know, with all those waggly sticks he had and uh, he got, got the built-in helmet. The uh, guy's like packing heat, no well, doubt about it. And the, cr the crown, I mean, doesn't look like it's a particularly efficient form of headgear, but no. actually it's got a force field around it that protects the monarchs. <laughs> it's the monarchs. That's why you never see monarchs with a black eye. <laughs> um, so so I'd, like to see, I'd like to see Charles take on the entire cabinet with his magic swords, his magic, was it the, the rods of fucking destiny or whatever it was or uh, unstoppable justice the, um, <laughs> the um, sledgehammer of everlasting vengeance um, that, that's your, those are all nicknames that you have for your penis Andrew <laughs> <laughs> I guess that was our secret <laughs> what um, goes on tour stays on tour um, uh, uh, so uh, yeah I'd, I'd like to see King Charles fully tooled up with all the royal accoutrements taking on the whole cabinet in a fight for the future of British politics. If he wins, we go back to an absolute monarchy. If not, we're stuck with democracy. It'd be like that scene in Kill Bill where Uma Thurman's character <laughs> takes on like 60 people. I'm into it. Yeah. Um, who would you like to see fight? Cards? I mean, I don't have anything quite as uh, inventive as, as these two, but I, I, would, I would be interested in maybe seeing the two female prime ministers duke it out. Theresa May versus Liz Truss. You were raising the pretty big one. Yeah. Oh, Thatcher. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah I guess. Okay. Mm, you yeah, mean the I, you'd well, like to see the two living female problems? Yeah, I reckon they could take her right now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm not, I'm I am not sure about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, fair enough, really... actually. As soon as I said it, I didn't yeah. think it was true. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I just think that, you know, both of them... As, uh, look, I, I, I'm just interested to see the damage that Theresa May's pointed toe can do, pointed shoes. You yeah. know, she famously wore those. And I do feel that Liz Truss, um, she always wears a pussy bow. I think that is, everybody knows in a street fight, you don't wear a tie. You don't wear a thing around the neck. I just think it would be a very fashionable brawl. And I'm interested in that. <laughs> I go Johnson versus Farage. I just, I want to see one of them go down. And I think the the other is the only one who could take the other down. Like I, they, they both seem like, it, it feels like this is what happens when an unstoppable force of racism meets an immovable object of also racism. Yeah. Um, we're going to finish with a lucky dip of PSUK listener questions. Ta -da. Oh, oh nice. we actually have a news He's got hat. A prop. That's so. Our fun. producer Musty has bought in a news hat, a phrase coined by Coco Khan <laughs> uh, uh, for reasons that we have no idea about. So I'm just going to go into the hat and pull out a uh, random listener question uh, that's on a piece of paper. I mean, this is just feel like this is how uh, debates should be conducted. Matthew Blackscad 
asks, it annoys me when people criticise MPs based on their voting records, when in reality, saying this twat voted for X bill I hate is basically saying this guy is a member of her or his political party, which doesn't really tell you about exactly how much of a twat they are. This is what it means to have political parties. It's what we're all voting for when we put our ex against a candidate who we've never heard of, but who has the right colour rosette velcroed to the system that governs Westminster. Maybe you might question whether things would be better if individual politicians could speak their mind a bit more, instead of marching in step with their parties like zombies. What do you think? Uh, yeah, I do agree with that. I think we need more independent MPs generally. Whatever format our second chamber takes, there needs to be s- scope for a lot of independence, I think, that bring sort of expertise and a bit of bit of balance. And when you say what we're voting for, because of the nature of our, our first-past-the-post system, to be honest, what we're voting for is quite often what we're voting against. Yeah. Um, and mm. also, it's... To, to interpret what someone actually means when they vote. Bearing in mind, you know, if you live in a... If you might be a passionate Green Party supporter, there's obviously no point voting Green yeah. in a general election unless you live in Brighton. So, so for a start, you can't do that. Then you might want um, a Labour government. But in order to do that, you've got to vote Liberal Democrat to stop the Conservatives from... from the, so there's all the, this subtext of votes is impossible to say. So until we have a system where which can interpret from how angrily the X is written in the box <laughs> on exactly what that person meant. Did you break the pencil or not? <laughs> then, then, then clearly proportional representation is not a uh, a panacea. It doesn't it doesn't fix all, all the problems, but I think it would allow an element of compromise in our politics, which um, appears to have otherwise uh, gone the way of the dodo. Yeah. Let's From a it. PR country, I would say absolutely. I'll never forget the first time that I, I saw Britain go into absolute collapse because they might have a hung parliament. I have to cooperate. Yeah. Yeah, have to grow up, essentially. <laughs> I, yeah. I was like, what is got genuinely adults being like, what? <laughs> Listen to each other, is it? <laughs> like, what? yeah, if you don't mind, like, yeah, is that is that cool? Oh, wild. Shall I do one? Yeah. Also, we ended up in a coalition with two guys who were basically the same man. <laughs> exactly. And they just decided from the outset who would be the yeah. bully. Bizarre. Oh, Laura asks, would you ever or have you ever, <laughs> would you ever or have you ever kissed a Tory? No. no. Not to my not knowledge. Knowingly, yeah. Not knowingly. Not knowingly, yeah. Also, I mean, if I'm going back through the list, it's not going to take long. <laughs> yeah, oh, oh, give, you. Give, give me five minutes to nip outside and make a couple of calls. <laughs> um, but well, the question romantically is... Romantically kissed a Tory. <laughs> <laughs> Do you feel like some, the some there? other with your mouth? <laughs> or like a Fredo kiss from Godfather 2. <laughs> <laughs> Judas kiss. Wait a second. But the question I think that's more interesting, especially for you, if you don't mind, um, is would you ever? Would I ever kiss yeah. a Tory? Um, <laughs> no, I... Um, I think that if I, I think there would be serious problems within my long term relationship if I kissed anyone else. But I think it's, I think I'm not, I don't want to speak out of turn here. And I will check with her to clarify how she feels about this. I think she would be furious if I cheated on her with anyone. But I think she'd be doubly furious if it was a Tory. Yeah, yeah, mine too. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. I think I would, I would kiss a Tory in certain circumstances. If, for example, I'd been told that if I kissed that Tory, they would turn back into a frog. <laughs> I might, I might, you know, be yep. prepared to do that. Yeah. But like, I'm in mean, a long, long term. I've been with my wife since, since, since the Tories were in power in the 1990s, actually. <laughs> but um, um, I think it depends how much they like cricket as well. But anyway, that's a, that's a different, I'd different say matter. I probably would imagine that cricket and conservative. Yeah. That's yeah. quite yeah. a high I don't want to talk about that. I don't want to talk about that. Okay. Cricket. <laughs> That's not uncomfortable for me. Okay, so we've got a question here from Charlie Taylor. They ask, with the year coming to an end and the countdown to what I personally hope is the Tories' electoral death sentence sometime next year, I wanted to ask you, what do you think is the worst thing the Tories have done in their decade-plus tenure? I mean, I think it's difficult to evaluate in terms of worst, but for me, it all comes back to the programme of austerity because the central message that the financial crisis was the result of excess government spending is was simply a mistruth. Like it was a simple, it was a straightforward lie. And it, it it's the kind of original sin of the last 13 years of governing because it creates uh, huge gaps in government funding. It sets problems in the NHS that then come back to haunt us as soon as the COVID pandemic starts. It, it, even the sort of decimation of large parts of the country and then the sort of rhetorical blaming of the European Union uh, kind of lays the foundations 
for some of the elements of the Brexit vote. So, I mean, for me, whilst I don't think it's necessarily the worst thing that they've done specifically, it's the kind of core original sin of the last 13 years of government. <laughs> I feel like there's too much to choose from for a start, but I'm going to pick something a bit more obscure, which is the Conservatives going for the National Trust. Because I felt like that was a... Uh, I mean, I know it's been a, a kind of a progress from the patrician Tory to this kind of like neoliberal yeah. um, money state trumps burners. everything, yeah. state burners. Like I know that's been it, it, happening for a long time, but I feel like sometimes they keep it under wraps and yeah. they try and present themselves as the party of, you know, our history, our heritage, our yeah. preserving the best things about Britain. Um, but actually they're, they're not. Um, no. And so I think that was like a... I wouldn't say that was the worst thing they did, but I thought it was an interesting thing they did when they started going for uh, like historic country houses for yeah. being too woke. I, yeah, I just think there's been a shift away from the notion of politics as service to one of self-aggrandizement. And I think for me, I, I'm going to pick a more nebulous concept and perhaps it's going to sound naive, but I think the utter eagerness to dehumanize anybody who's other than them, which is a lot of people. Yeah. You see it when they talk about people as boats instead of actual people. You hear it when they, I mean, when the entire process during COVID, when they managed to lie about like celebratory behavior in the midst of tragedy. I just think there's a complete absolute repulsion of the notion of empathy or compassion and I would it would be hard for me to ever forgive them for the thing it. about empathy mate is it doesn't pay it yeah. doesn't but I tell you what it does is the self-serving nature of that I think has been pervasive societally I think we are an angrier sadder more furious place to live and even when I I am too which is like it, it permeates that yeah. sort of frustration and you when everybody above you seeks to serve themselves, you, you almost end up giving in to that and doing the same. And it makes me so sad. Uh, Andrew? Um, well, that was very eloquently put. And I, yeah, I mean, that's a, a really good way of looking at it, I think. I mean, in, and also picking up what Nish, Nish was saying, you know, if I, to focus on Brexit, and I, you know, I take that it was a, almost a kind of symptom and result of those austerity policies when I think about the sort of future that my kids are inheriting from this generation of politics, and I think Brexit is still, yeah, sort of the defining aspect of that, and for them to sort of grow up without the the freedoms and opportunities that that my generation and my parents' generation had is really saddening. And um, yeah, and aside from the the nature of the society that you were talking about, Catherine, uh, as well. So looking ahead to the the future, I think the legacy of these thirteen years of Conservative government is really really depressing. And I think it's yeah, really hard time to be a, a young person to have you know that the conversation about politics conducted in in that that harsh, aggressive, sort of dehumanizing way. Plus the fact that whether it's environmentally or in terms of the, the jobs you might have or the, the the freedoms you have being sort of constricted by that. So I think that's it's not it's not a great legacy for 13 years of government yeah. to, have, to have left behind. I guess, you know, the idea that, you know, they've created a selfish country that is bad vibes, I think we can all agree that has happened. I do wonder if, is it them that has done that or has this been a long a long creation of a selfish but, nation. Well, I think actually, I actually think we were, a lot of Britain were trying to do the opposite. Like if you think about how most people in the world, not just in this country, behaved during COVID, most people pushed the greater good above themselves. Most people did that enthusiastically, willingly, carefully, considerably. Most people said, I am part of my community yeah. and I care about them regardless of the consequences for me. And even in that context, where everybody sort of surrendered to the betterment of all, this government managed to be so cynical about that behaviour that they came out, made us come out feeling like we somehow are more against one another than we ever have been before. I hate them. <laughs> and, that, and that is sort of probably a hopeful note for us to end on in terms of um, if you lose your faith in politicians, you shouldn't lose your faith in people. Yeah, yeah, And yeah. we shouldn't lose our faith in people's ability to transform politics. As we go into an election year, you know, it is important to remember that we do have agency and we have agency in who we vote for, but then we also have agency in what we pressure them to do once they're in office. And that's probably going to be the key 
thing that keeps me hopeful and optimistic uh, in 2024. Thank you so much to everyone who's got in touch with the show this year. It's been wonderful to see a community of listeners come together around such diverse subjects as various serious political and economic issues, but also a sort of broad interest in uh, Fast and the Furious films and <laughs> people's ridiculous YouTube usernames, most famously of all, Chicken Nug Nugs. Um, we hope you're well uh, wherever you are and you're being uh, supplied with as much chicken nug nugs as you can eat. Oh, Turkey nug nugs this time of year. <laughs> <laughs> they deserve it. Um, uh, it just leaves me to say a, a very quick and a very heartfelt thank you to Andy Zaltzman and Catherine Bohart for joining us for the last two episodes. It's been a pleasure, Nish. Um, we do, and thank you to the listeners both for listening and for contributing we don't always have time to include your messages on the podcast but we always read them and we love getting your uh, feedback whether it's good or bad we don't really love the bad that was a complete <laughs> lie <laughs> so if you do have something you'd like to share with us you can get in touch by emailing psuk at reducedlistening.co.uk we love hearing your voices so do send us a voice note the number is 07514 644572 you can save that number and then when someone asks for you, like chats you up at a pub and you give a fake number give them that <laughs> that's the service we offer yes <laughs> we can do that internationally too <laughs> It's plus four four seven five one four six four four five seven two. Thanks very much for listening. You can catch up on episodes. Uh, we'll be back next week. Don't forget to follow at Pod Save the UK in the meantime on Instagram and Twitter. You can also find us on YouTube for access to full episodes and other exclusive content. And if you are as opinionated as we are, consider dropping us a review. Coco will only accept five star reviews, but my bar is lower. I'll take three and up. <laughs> Pod Save the UK is a reduced listing production for Crooked Media. Thanks to senior producer Musty Aziz and digital producer Alex Bishop with additional production support from Tanya Hines, Ed Morish and Annie Keats Thorpe. Video editing was by Will Darkin and the music is by Vasilis Fotopoulos. Thanks to our engineer David Dargahi. The executive producers are Anishka Sharma, Dan Jackson and Madeline Herringer with additional support from Ari Schwartz. Remember to hit subscribe for new shows on Thursdays on Amazon, Spotify or Apple or wherever you get your podcasts. Bye.